everybody and welcome to another installment of Guns Across the Lakes. My name is Charles Johnson and I'm the educator here at the Erie Maritime Museum in U.S. Brig, Niagara. Today's center of focus is on the construction of the American Squadron at Presque Isle. However, it's one which actually starts with the fall of Fort Mackinac. On that day, Erie's Daniel Dobbins was captured and paroled on the promise that he would not take up arms against the Crown. Less than one month later, on August 16th, he found himself a prisoner yet again with the surrender of Fort Detroit to British forces. Faced with execution for failing to keep his promise, Dobbins sought out British Colonel Robert Nichols, a friend of his prior to the war, for protection. Granted leave, he returned home to Erie, bringing with him eyewitness accounts of the loss of the frontier to Erie's residents, as well as General David Meade, commander of the Pennsylvania Militia at Erie. Meade instructed Dobbins to travel to Washington, D.C. to inform President Madison of this crushing blow. It seemed as if our empire in the Northwest was gone. The New York frontier threatened and in greater jeopardy than ever before. President Madison exclaimed, we must gain control of the lakes. Therein lies our only safety. Dobbins suggested that a naval force be constructed on Lake Erie, and Presque Isle was just the place. The reason for that being, there was no finer oak than was to be found right here. Following his trip to Washington, Dobbins returned home to Erie with a $2,000 draft on Navy funds to commence construction on four gunboats. To build a squadron in the wilderness was no simple task, one plagued with poor supply lines and transport made even more difficult considering the sheer lack of settlement in the area. The only thing immediately available was timber. Steel came from Meadville and after a laborious haul through wild country, carpenters tools and nail rods found their way from Pittsburgh, iron from Bellefonte, spike iron from Buffalo, and a shipment of four foremasts, four main mists, four main booms, four bowsprits, 60 sweeps, and 50 14-foot oars from Blackrock. On New Year's Day 1813, Commodore Isaac Chauncey made his first stop in Erie to inspect the site's progress. Deeming the gunboats too small, he ordered the ones yet planked to be enlarged. He then made a stop in New York City where he met and hired Master Shipwright Noah Brown to assume command of the shipbuilding operations at Presque Isle. The trip for Brown and his crew of 15 shipwrights lasted two weeks, trekking 450 miles of frozen land. When they arrived in Erie on March 6, 1813, they found a small frontier town of 500 people with only two of the four gunboats planked. Construction occurred at two separate locations. Tigris, Scorpion, and Porcupine were built at Lee's Run, while Briggs Lawrence, Ariel, and Niagara were built at Cascade Creek. By late March 1813, Brown and his crew had already laid the keels of the Briggs, Niagara, and Lawrence and started to work on their frames. On March 27th, 27-year-old Oliver Hazard Perry assumed command of the squadron at Presque Isle after making his trip from Buffalo on a sledge of ice. Where he lacked in combat experience, he proved knowledgeable in ship construction and the command of small fleets. In Pittsburgh, Perry secured a supplier to produce shot, anchors, stoves, and cordage. Sailcloth is ordered from Philadelphia, however, a naval squadron is not complete without its guns. For this, some were cast in Georgetown, while the rest were sent from Sackett's Harbor. For both sides, the greatest challenge facing them after shipbuilding was recruitment. Even into late July, Perry was unsatisfied with the lack of able-bodied men making their way to Erie. Seemingly casting aside protocol, he went around his superior and sent a letter directly to the Secretary of the Navy to complain, I have not heard that any seamen have yet left Sackett's Harbor for this place. As soon as they arrive, we shall meet the enemy. There were 372 naval personnel, including PA militia, both enlisted and officer, as well as somewhere around 150 regular infantry and militia who volunteered for duty in the fleet from Harrison's army. The enemy were in the habit of making almost daily visits to Presque Isle, sometimes just Queen Charlotte, other times the whole fleet would menace. By late July, all American ships were complete and launched, and on Sunday morning, August 1st, Perry got underway with all of his vessels in tow, sailing in a light breeze from the northeast, onward toward the entrance of the channel. It is here where they commenced the process of getting the larger brigs over the sandbar that was blocking the entrance into Lake Erie. Engineered by shipwright Noah Brown, two barges called camels were brought along for the task. The concept was to pull the camels up and lash them to both sides of the two larger brigs, Lawrence and Niagara, and be flooded. When water was pumped out of them, they would in turn raise the ships further out of the water and over the sandbar, one at a time. To protect the squadron during this process, Perry mounted a water battery of three long 12-pounders on the beaches, a field battery on Garrison Hill, and another where the land lighthouse now stands. During this process, Queen Charlotte and Lady Prevost did make a visit. However, wind and haze prevented them from seeing what was actually happening. Ariel and Scorpion were not sent out to meet the ships. However, when they did leave, Perry rejoiced at not having to meet the enemy then. The whole process lasted until August 5th, when the U.S. Brig Niagara left the sheltered harbor of Presque Isle and made its way into the lake. 
Before we close out this week's chapter, our story returns to shore where throughout the summer of 1813, seven brave Erie women steadfast in the face of a brewing conflict stayed behind to stitch the rallying banner that Oliver Perry would carry into battle. Although many fled south, Margaret Forrester Stewart, her sister Dorcas, and five nieces stayed behind to complete this flag. The flag emblazoned with the dying words of Captain James Lawrence, don't give up the ship, remains forever etched in American naval heritage and was set to fly high above the decks of Lawrence's namesake vessel. Before we set forth to do battle on Lake Erie, our story returns to Fort Meigs, where a second siege is taking place. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, huzzah.